Mr. President, uh, dear delegates, uh, first of all, I would like to say that it's really an honor to be back here and to meet with you. This time in this beautiful city of uh, Istanbul. Last time I think we met in uh, Norway, in uh, uh, Stavanger. And uh, I will speak to you about uh, the challenges and the tasks that uh, NATO is uh, facing and how NATO is responding. But before I do that, I would like to thank the Turkish parliament for hosting us. And I would also like to thank the president, uh, Mike Turner, for the excellent way he has chaired this assembly and the cooperation I have had with him. Uh, and uh, we have met many different times in many different occasions, but I remember very well when uh, Mike attended the NATO summit in Warsaw. He spoke to the leaders, and uh, when you did that, I actually thought about the importance of having you representing the parliaments around the table with the heads of state and government uh, in uh, Warsaw. Uh, and I look forward to work with the new president, uh, and uh, I uh, promise that I will continue to be uh, in close contact with the NATO Parliamentary Assembly for many reasons, uh, but uh, not least because this assembly is an, a very important political body. Uh, because the NATO Parliamentary Assembly is truly a transatlantic institution, binding uh, NATO together across the Atlantic uh, with representatives from the European and NATO allies, from Canada and the United States, and uh, partner nations. And the bonds, the partnership, the friendship you create in this uh, assembly is important for the whole alliance because it strengthens the transatlantic uh, bond. Second, this assembly is important because you are representing the national parliaments. And I believe I've said this before, but I will repeat it because it is so important. I have been a parliamentarian myself, and I know the importance of parliaments in decision-making in the different uh, NATO allied countries. Because parliaments decide on the guidelines, the framework for defense and security policies, no government can conduct in the, in the long term a policy which is against the will of the parliaments. So therefore, what you decide, what you agree, is of great importance for what NATO can do and what NATO allies are able to agree on. You are key for key decisions for NATO, like, for instance, defense spending. And that has been my main focus since I became uh, Secretary General in 2014, is how can we increase defense spending among those NATO allies which are spending less than 2%. And that is actually your main responsibility, is to decide budgets. And therefore, I know that to speak to you is of great importance for me, uh, because uh, you are the uh, representatives representing those parliaments which are, at the end, deciding defense spending in the different uh, NATO allied countries. You are also key for another reason, and that is because parliaments, parliaments actually uh, decide who is going to be member of NATO. And uh, uh, you know that we are now in the process of uh, uh, inviting the process of enlarging NATO with a new member, uh, Montenegro. The accession uh, uh, treaty is signed. What remains to be done is the ratification. And uh, many nations have already ratified the accession uh, uh, agreement for uh, Montenegro. It has to be done in all 28 uh, parliaments. So I urge those parliaments, I urge those countries that have not yet signed, no, sorry, ratified the accession agreement for Montenegro to do so. This is a responsibility for you, for the parliaments, and I speak directly to you. Go back to your parliaments, make sure that you ratify that accession agreement as soon as possible. We will have a summit in NATO next year, and it is really something I think we should be able to deliver by the summit next year, that we have uh, uh, the accession agreement ratified by all parliaments, uh, so we can welcome uh, Montenegro as a full member by the uh, summit in 2017, and that may happen early 17. So you have to hurry up and to ratify the accession agreement. So as you understand, 
I attach great importance to the NATO Parliamentary Assembly because you represent parliaments which are so important for uh, our uh, alliance. There is a, yet another reason why I believe that this assembly is of great importance. And that is uh, just, the two, uh, just the plain fact that uh, you represent different parties, different nations, different opi political opinions. So the NATO Parliamentary Assembly is a platform for political discussion, for political uh, exchange between different people, different uh, 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 opinions. And I think this magnitude, this, 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 this variety of uh, uh, opinions are of great importance uh, in itself because it reflects that NATO is a, uh, an alliance of 28 uh, democracies. There are disagreements, there are different views, there are different positions on many issues. But the strength of NATO is that we have always been able to agree on the core task, on our core responsibility, and to stand together uh, on the message that we are here to protect each other, to uh, uh, defend each other, uh, and to uh, stand together in the strongest alliance of the, uh, uh, of, of the world. And that was actually also what we managed to do at Warsaw. At the summit, we made important decisions on uh, collective defense, on projecting stability, and on uh, working uh, together with the European Union to strengthen our cooperation with the European Union. And I will address briefly these issues, and then I'm more than happy to answer questions on all the other issues and uh, also elaborate a bit more on collective defense, projected stability um, uh, later on uh, during the Q&A uh, session. Uh, but uh, before I do that, I would just uh, also uh, remind us all uh, of the fact that we are meeting here in Turkey four short months after the failed coup attempt. Uh, this should be a sober reminder to us all, a reminder that democracy and freedom cannot be taken for granted. They must be vigorously defended. In September, I visited the Grand National Assembly in Ankara, which had uh, been shelled by tanks and F-16s, uh, bombed by F-16s. I saw the damage that was done and I met members of the parliament from all major political parties. They rushed uh, to the parliament on the night of the coup attempt and stood together in defense of their democratic institutions. It made a lasting impression on me, and I want to salute uh, them today for their courage and dedication to democracy. Democracy individual liberty and the rule of law are NATO's core values. And I personally attach great importance to them, as you do, members uh, of the NATO Parliamentary Assembly. And the NATO Parliamentary Assembly is a platform for democratic debate and open exchange uh, of different views uh, among parliamentarians from all our member states and partner uh, countries. Uh, and the important thing is that given that we all represent different nations and we represent different political parties, we again and again have proven that we are able to stand together uh, in the alliance uh, on the main message of collective defense and the uh, will to defend each other. And that was exactly what we did in Warsaw. And uh, we uh, decided to strengthen our collective defense uh, in response to Russia's aggressive actions in Ukraine and ongoing military buildup of Russia. NATO has taken prudent and necessary steps. We are increasing our defensive presence in the eastern part of the alliance including the deployment of four multinational battalions to the Baltic States and Poland. Earlier this year, Canada, Germany, the United Kingdom, and the United States each committed to lead one of those battalions. 
and I want to thank those nations for their leadership. I also want to express my appreciation to the 13 other uh, allies that have pledged to join these forces. Our preparations for the four battalions are on track. We expect uh, to deploy all four battalions uh, in early 2017. This sends a clear message. NATO is united. We stand together as one. And an attack on one ally will be considered an attack against us all. NATO is also taking steps to strengthen our presence in the Black Sea region. There will be a Romanian-led multinational brigade. And we are working uh, on additional defensive measures in the air and at sea as well. Everything NATO does is defensive, proportionate, and fully in line with our international commitments. Before Russia's aggressive actions in uh, Ukraine, NATO had no plans to send troops to the eastern part of our alliance. NATO's aim is to prevent a conflict, not to provoke a conflict. Moreover, we firmly believe uh, and we are firmly committed to a two-track approach to Russia. Strong defense coupled with meaningful dialogue. When tensions run high, it is even more important to keep channels of communication open. With increasing military activity close to our borders, we must do everything we can to prevent military incidents or accidents. And if they do occur, we must keep them from spiraling out of control. That is why we held two meetings of the NATO-Russia Council uh, this year. <clears throat> the other major team at the Warsaw Summit uh, was projecting stability. We know that if our neighbors are stable, we are more secure. NATO helps to build stability in our neighborhood through capacity building, training, working with partners, and maritime security. NATO has been on the front line in the fight against terrorism for many years, including through our operation and military presence in Afghanistan, which was launched in the response of the 9-11 terrorist attacks against the United States. And as you know, this is the first and the only time NATO has invoked our collective defense clause, Article 5. Our experience <coughs> in Afghanistan has shown that having strong, highly trained local forces is vital to a country's security and stability. Training local forces is one of our best weapons in the fight against terrorism. This year alone, we have trained hundreds of Iraqi officers in Jordan, and we recently decided to extend our training and capacity uh, efforts, building efforts, into Iraq. That work will begin early next year. This training is an important contribution to the fight against ISIL, as is our AWACS surveillance aircraft, now flying uh, from Konya here in Turkey in support of the counter-ISIL uh, coalition. The situation in the Mediterranean remains serious. In response, earlier this month, we launched NATO's new maritime security operation, Sea Guardian. This operation will help protect the safety and the security of one of the world's busiest bodies of water. NATO's ships, submarines, and maritime patrol aircraft will perform core activities like surveillance, counterterrorism, and capacity building of regional navies. And NATO is supporting EU's Operation Sophia with information sharing and logistical support. 
this cooperation with the European Union in the Mediterranean is just uh, one example of the benefit of closer cooperation between NATO and the European Union. The two organizations have transformed Europe, building the foundation for peace, security and prosperity. And I'm pleased uh, to say that NATO-EU cooperation is now closer than it has ever been. And this was underscored by the joint declaration I signed with President, uh, uh, the two President uh, Tusk and, uh, and uh, Juncker in Warsaw in July. And uh, there is a momentum in the NATO-EU cooperation. And we must take this momentum, this opportunity to uh, further strengthen and to do more in the field of NATO-EU cooperation. We are exploring uh, ways to work together to counter hybrid threats, enhance cybersecurity, and coordinate exercises. As you all know, the European Union is considering options for strengthening European defense. And I welcome that initiative because it offers a way for European allies to deliver more capabilities and increased defense spending. Doing so will strengthen Europe, the EU, and NATO. It is important to make sure that those efforts are complementary, transparent, and mutually supportive, and that non-EU allies are closely involved because they make essential contributions to European security. A stronger Europe will mean a stronger NATO, and it will reinforce the transatlantic bond, a bond that has served the vital security interests of NATO members on both sides of the Atlantic. With that in mind, I, welcoming, I am welcoming uh, the incoming administration in uh, Washington. And I look forward uh, to working with President-elect Donald Trump. The partnership between Europe and the United States has been rock solid for almost 70 years. A partnership that has always received bipartisan uh, support in the United States. <coughs> and better burden sharing uh, will make the transatlantic bond even stronger. After years of sliding defense spending, we have seen a shift. At our Wales summit in 2014, allies committed to spend 2% of GDP on defense within a decade. That commitment is already bearing fruit. In 2015, we stopped the defense cuts and we saw a spending increase across Europe and Canada. I expect further increase of 3% for European allies and Canada this year. So we are moving in the right direction, but we have a long way to go. And <clears throat> defense spending to reach the 2% tar target really matters. And let me illustrate by, following, uh, by the following example. If all European allies and Canada were to meet the 2% uh, spending target, that would mean an extra $100 billion, $100 billion worth of improvements to our capabilities. <clears throat> that is roughly the equivalent to the combined defense budgets of the two largest defense spenders in Europe, the United Kingdom and France, every year. This is where all of you come in. I'm confident that NATO can count on your continued support, just as we have relied on the support of the NATO Parliamentary Assembly over the past six decades. Since the founding of NATO in 1949, we have helped to secure the peace and provide the foundation for freedom and prosperity. Supported by our citizens and their elected representatives and dedicated to continued peace and security for our people and for future generations. So thank you for your support, thank you for your attention, and I'm looking forward to continue to work with all of you
to strengthen the transatlantic bond and to strengthen NATO. Thank you.